Our next speaker is Viktor Kirillov. He is an author of a testing framework and he openly admitted to me that before creating that framework, he hadn't written any tests in his life. His interests generally include creating games and game engines, high performance code, data oriented design, and good practices in software development. Let's welcome Viktor Kirillov. Thank you very much. So I'll today introduce DocTest and I'll talk about many implementation details about the framework. So firstly, I'm from Bulgaria with four years of professional C++ in the games and VFX industries. And for the past two years, I've been working on personal projects since I quit. And I've been also doing some consulting and contract work. I also use different compilers, even Mscripten. Mscript I like multi-platform code. And I make heavy use of CMake, Python, Git. I love Clang format. And I debug my programs with Valgrind and desanitizers. And I also think GitHub is an amazing place, which is like a social network for programmers nowadays. So I like to call doc test the lightest feature each C++ single header testing framework. And it's inspired by the ability of other compiled languages such as D, Rust, and Nim to have tests written directly in the production code. The project mantra is that tests can be considered a form of documentation, and they should be able to reside near the code which they test. So doc test borrows many ideas from catch. The interface is almost identical. And uh, there are also some ideas taken from boost test and Google test. And, uh, since Catch is currently the one which is most similar, uh, I'll compare it mainly with it. So there are two big things which Catch has and DocTest doesn't. There are currently a reporter synth system, something different than to the console, so to XML, user-defined, etc. And the other thing is matchers. But DocTest has some features of its own, like test suits and template test cases. There is also this great repository by Mart Martin, which compares three very similar testing frameworks, Catch, Lest, and DocTest. So in this presentation, I'll introduce you to the framework, and then I'll continue with implementation details, like how tests are registered automatically, how I decompose expressions with templates, and etc. Then I'll show some compile time benchmarks and in examples of how to integrate tests in production code. I will not be talking about how to write tests in general, because there are plenty of talks on that topic. So first of all, doc test being a single header framework, there are two ways we can approach that. We either make everything in line and uh, all the dependencies are leaked everywhere, or we separate the header in two parts. First, the forward declaration part, which is the public interface of the library. And then the second part, which is uh, conditionally compiled in only one translation unit if some identifier is defined before including the framework header. That's where, in the case of doc test, all the dependencies go. All the includes, including windows.h for colors, colors in the terminal, Everything goes in the implementation part, and that is compiled in only one translation unit of your entire project. Everywhere else, you use only the, implement, uh, the forward declaration stuff, the interface, which is at the top. That way, we uh, make sure that compile time and link times are kept to a minimum. Here's a complete example of a program which compiles and links. So first, we tell doctors that it should bring in the test runner and also provide a main entry point. Then we include the framework header. Then we have uh, some factorial function, which we're going to test. After that, there is a self-registering test case, which has four assertions. And the first one of them will fail because we have a bug. And uh, here is the output from that program. Uh, first, we get told which test case failed, and then which assertion, where it was located. And we even get the result of fact of zero. So we don't have to rerun the tests to see what value actually that function returned. And at the end, we get a nice summary of how many test cases and assertions have passed and failed. What makes doc test different? Well, in two words, it is light and unintrusive. It has the smallest possible footprint on compile times. You can remove everything testing related from the binary. There is no namespace pollution. All macros are or can be prefixed. It doesn't track any headers with it. I mean, in the public part, which is the interface. It produces zero warnings, even on the most aggressive warning levels and it's very easy to integrate with user code. The idea is that even if you include it across your entire project, you don't notice it, not in build times and not in any artifacts like warnings or stuff. And it's also very reliable. Each time I push on GitHub, um, 
a top, more than 300 different configurations are built and tested on Travis and Avior, which are CI services integrated with GitHub. So I built in debug and release 32 and 64 bit modes with all these compilers on Linux OS Hicks and Windows. Warnings are treated as errors. I run, I run the test through Valgrind and I use the sanitizers. I also build in C 98 and 11 modes, with and without exceptions, with and without RTTI, and I use five different static analyzers. So it should be pretty stable. And all this makes writing tests in the production code feasible, which in turn would lead to the following. You don't have to make separate source files, commit them to source control, add them to the build system, and include a bunch of things. You can just implement, I mean, you can just write the test for some module at the end of its implementation file in place. And also, tests can be viewed as up-to-date comments, because when you compile your production code, you compile also the tests, so they're always up-to-date. And um, also, some companies have problems testing unexposed exter uh, internals of their implementation because they're not exposed uh, through their public APIs. And this way, if you write the tests uh, in place in the implementation, you get that. And also, test-driven development in C++ becomes pretty straightforward with this. And even if you don't like the idea of mixing tests and production code, you can still use the framework like any other and still benefit from the fast compile times and clean design. So the most notable features are that there is one core assertion macro which decomposes the expressions. So you don't have to explicitly give the left and right operands and say that it is for equality or not equality or etc. Um, test cases are registered automatically. You don't have to come up with unique identifiers and then list them somewhere. So we're keeping things dry, as in don't repeat yourself. Um, also, subcases are just like sections in catch, and they're a way to, se uh, to share setup and cleanup code for test cases. For example, here we need to make two test cases, which both need to open a database connection and close it. So instead of copy-pasting like uh, in the code snippet on the right, we can write the code on the left, and uh, I'll explain how subcases work in a later slide. Also, there are logging facilities, for example, if we are comparing uh, elements of two arrays and uh, some of them are not equal, we would like to have some context. In this case, the counter i. And uh, what's special about the logging facilities of Doctest is that this string is not constructed unless it's needed. So there are no locations if the assertion doesn't fail. So it has lazy stringification of the info call I've made. And uh, if the assertion failed, uh, we get a nice, uh, with context, the value of i75 in the output. Also, um, you can teach the framework how to translate your exception types, and I'll talk about that later. So in this case, when we have uh, some function which throws and we use it in an assertion, we'll get a string representation of our exception. Also, you can teach the framework how to stringify your types, because when two values don't, uh, are not equal, for example, you would like to see their string representation in the output, and you can teach the framework how to do it for your types. Also, there are templated test cases. In this case, we're instantiating a test case on a list of types. So we'll get three test cases in this case. And uh, here we're testing the following. We're default constructing uh, type T, then we're serializing it, we're, then we're deserializing it, and we're checking that uh, what we started with is the same with what we got. Uh, there are also uh, assertions for dealing with exceptions, like to check if something throws or to check if something doesn't throw. And there's also a utility class to help us with comparing floating points. There are also decorators, which is an idea taken from Boost Test, where we can mark a test case to be skipped if some predicate returns true, or maybe mark a test case to be marked as failed if it takes more than 200 milliseconds. And there are some other decorators as well. This is extendable. There are also, there's also crash handling, and uh, failures can break into the debugger. When an assertion fails, you can break into the debugger. Also, the command line is quite rich with lots of options. For example, we can list all the test cases. We can filter test cases using wildcards. You, we can exclude test suits using wildcards in case everything which, which is deprecated. We can tell the framework to abort after 10 failed assertions. We can tell it to randomize the order of uh, test cases before executing them, not to break into the debugger, and there is also range-based execution of tests. So I don't know of any frameworks which are big, which support uh, spawning multiple test cases in multiple threads, 
but um, with doc test you can just ask the binary how many test cases there are and then just tell it to execute different ranges so with some shell script or some utility script you could make parallelization yourself if it, that's important for you so let's get into some details and I should warn you that uh, this presentation and this framework relies heavily on macros so yeah first of all we need the some ability to construct unique names and in this case we're using the anonymous macro I should have called it unique and um, it concatenates a literal with the result of counter counter is an identifier which yields a bigger integer it's used it's from the preprocessor and uh, it is per translation unit so it, for each source file you compile, it starts from zero. And uh, if we have used it like five times already in this translation unit, those two lines will generate a non-var5 and a non-var6, which would be unique var5 on a unique var6. Um, this test case, which will register itself automatically, the code for it will look like the following after the preprocessor. First, we have a forward declaration of the test function. After that, there is a global dummy integer to which we assign the result of rec test. The whole point is to get some code to be executed before we enter main. That is why globals are initialized. And to rec test, we pass the function pointer, the name of the test case, where it was written, like which source file on which line, and also in which test suite it's in. After that, we follow the definition of the test function the user has written. Also here, I'm using static for the test function and the global dummy integer, because otherwise these names um, they're unique only for the current translation unit, but uh, if these weren't static, we could get linker errors because of tests from another translation unit. So, when we call rec test before we have entered main while globals are initialized, we need to put that test case into some registry. But uh, we can't simply make the registry a global variable inside of the test runner because we have no guarantees that it will be initialized. So this is called the static initialization order fiasco in C++. C++ guarantees us that the order of initialization of globals in a single translation unit is top to bottom, but between uh, different translation units, no guarantees. So what can we do? Here I've made a getter function, which has a local static variable, which is then returned by reference. So when the first time I call this getter function, I actually construct the registry and then I return it by reference and I insert the test case and after that I return zero just to initialize the dummy integer which forced rec test to be called in the first place. So, just a sec. Test cases can be put inside of test suite blocks and um, doc test provides some get function inside of a TS namespace by default which returns an empty string. But when we put a test case inside of a test suite block, the test suite macro expands to the following. Um, a unique namespace inside of which there is a TS namespace which has a get function which returns the actual name of the current test suite. Then we close all the namespaces and we reopen again the same unique namespace just to reuse the opening curly brace the user has written for the block. And after that, when the test case macro expands and it calls TS get, it actually calls the one from the unique namespace we have just introduced. Let's talk about warnings. So DocTest doesn't produce absolutely any warnings, even on everything for Clang, all for Visual Studio, except for these four, because uh, they're too noisy and they're inlining related. Practically, I don't think anybody is using them. And uh, for GCC, all and extra, pedantic, and over, and over 37 other flags which are not covered by all and extra. This is the, this is the list of other warnings. For example, I think Shadow is a very controversial, but I personally like to use it. Uh, so the framework should be clean from all possible warnings. And uh, if you're curious which warnings are left enabled or disabled after passing all and extra to GCC, you could use the last line on this slide to see that. These slides will be available later on the internet. So, suppose doc test header has some structure which has some padding in it, and Clank emits a warning that uh, it is padded. This is not a serious warning, it's a diagnostic, but we would still like to silence it. So, what should we do? Every decent compiler supports a diagnostic stack through pragmas, and uh, the doc test header is surrounded with such pragmas at the start and at the end, so we push the stack, we say that we ignore something, and then we pop from the stack. 
so the warning is not left uh, disabled after the header. But what about warnings which are emitted from the macros which the user uses? Because they're expanded not inside of the header, they're expanded inside of the user code. F so, for example, when we register test cases with our global dummy integer, Clank emits the global constructor's warning and GCC the unused variable one. We can't ask the user to surround their code with fragments. What can we do? So, let's see how the preprocessor works. Suppose we have a source file and the header file, which is included by the source file. There's some comments, some macro, and the pragma. After the preprocessor, we get the following translation unit, which is passed to the compiler. First of all, there are no more comments. The header file is included inside of the source file. The macro is uh, expanded and substituted properly. And, but there are these weird lines with hashtags left. They're the way that the compiler will use to tell you where the errors you have actually came from. In this case, we have a variable redefinition inside of the header. We have int a twice. So that's how the compiler knows how to tell you where the error actually came from. And we, what we also see is the pragma survived the preprocessor because it's actually a directive for the compiler, not for the preprocessor. So, how can we embed a pragma inside of a macro? Well, we can use the underscore pragma operator, which was standardized in C++11, but it's actually supported by all the compilers for the past uh, 10 or something years. And uh, in this case, we have made the parallel, trans parallel transform macro, which uh, makes a for loop, and we are trying to parallelize it with the OpenMP extension in case it's installed. And um, after the preprocessor, the code on the left becomes the code on the right, and we see that the pragmas are right where we want them to be. So in the case for our global dummy integer, to silence the warning for it, we just uh, surround, uh, surround it with such pragmas uh, inside of our multi-line macro. And uh, sadly, in the case of GCC, the C++ frontend is having problems with the pragma operator for the past couple of years. There are some bug reports. And uh, luckily, I've been able to silence the warning using the attribute unused. I don't know if it, yeah. I've annotated the, the integer as unused with an attribute. So let's see what subcases do. The code on the left will have the output on the right without the empty lines. Um, what we can see is that there are a few subcases which are sort of nested. So this thing represents something like a tree. And uh, it has three leaf nodes. And uh, what we see on the right is that the setup string is printed three times. That's because we enter the test case three times, because there are three leaf nodes. So you can think of it as a depth for search traversal of a tree. Each time we enter the test case, we reach some leaf node of the subcases, and then we pop out. And this is very useful to share setup and cleanup code of your tests, like opening database connections, files, and uh, setting up data, which, will, which you would like to test in different ways. So these subcases on the left will expand to the following on the, onto the right, just simple if statements. And in those if statements, we construct subcase objects, which we bind to constant references to extend their lifetimes. And uh, that temporary will be alive until we leave the entire if statement, including its then clause. So if we enter inside of the if, well, that temporary object is still alive. And then if we enter another one, it is also alive. So we can keep uh, something like a stack of currently entered subcases based on their constructors and destructors. Also, we figure out if we should enter the then block of this statement based on what operator bool returns of the subcase class. And uh, based on the information we've given the constructor of the subcase class, in this case, which file uh, we've written it and uh, what line, it determines using globals which are inside of the test runner if this subcase should be traversed or it has been already traversed or if it should be traversed on the next, on subsequent re entry of the test case. And then it sets some internal boolean, which is returned by the operator bool. What we immediately see is that subcases cannot be uh, seen in advance how many there are inside of the test case. They cannot be registered ahead of time. Uh, they are lazily discovered when we enter the test case the first time. And also, we can nest uh, subcases infinitely for very, very fine-grained control over setup and cleanup code, well, as long as we have the necessary RAM. 
also, so in the first example, I showed uh, how a simple example looks like, but uh, if we're mixing tests and production code, we might want to supply our own main function. In that case, we'll need to just implement the test runner without telling dot test to bring a main function. And here is how we would write our own main. First, we make a context object, then we can set some default options. We can parse the command line, we can set some overrides, these are all optional. And then we can call run on the context, and that will either run queries, execute tests, or nothing. And after that, we ask the context if we should text it. That's done to support the three logical scenarios we would need. We would either want to be able to execute only tests, only the program, or both, if we are mixing production code and tests. So when we pass the exit flag to the, through the command line, that means after executing tests, quit. If we pass the no run option, that means don't execute tests, but continue with the program. And also when we execute queries, like how many test cases there are, we would like to just get that information and quit immediately. So that's how these three scenarios are supported. And if we're, <coughs> if we're mixing tests and production code, we might want to remove them from the final build, which we ship to customers. In that case, we should define the config disable identifier globally, and it turns all test cases into uninstantiated templates. So even in the bug builds, they're never present inside of the binary. And uh, this way, lightning, um, lightning, compile times and linking uh, become lightning fast. But uh, we can take it a step further because even if the test case is never instantiated as a template, it still has to be parsed. So we can affect even the assertion macros with this identifier. And in my case, I'm turning them into a no-op using void of zero, just so I can swallow the semicolon, which is written by the user after the macro. And uh, also most of the test runner is also removed from the binary. So literally it's as if no tests were written at all. Also in compile times, it's really as if no tests were written at all. So let's see how expressions are decomposed by the assertions. In this case, the assertion at the top will look like something at the bottom after the preprocessor. First, everything is wrapped inside of a do-while loop, which loops only once because the condition is false. And this is a common practice to make uh, multiple statements inside of one block for multi-line macros. And uh, also I'm using the void 0, 0, trick to silence the conditional expression is constant warning for Visual Studio inside of making a while false loop. So inside of the do-while loop, First, I construct a result builder object to which I give the appropriate information, like where the test case was written and etc. Then, inside of a try block, I evaluate the expression, and if anything happens, I call the exception to current method on the result builder. And if the assertion failed, be it because of an, uh, of an exception or it just wasn't true, uh, we can break into the debugger. So, let's see what happens inside of the try block. We construct an expression decomposer object which uh, has an overloaded left shift operator, which has a higher precedence over the comparison operators inside of C++. So that way we swallow the left operand of the comparison. And then that left shift operator returns a different type, which has overloaded the comparison operators, which swallow the right operand. And we'll see that on the next slide. Here's the expression the composer class and his um, templated left shift operator is just swallows the left operand and returns the left operand type, which holds a constant reference to the left operand. And uh, that type is shown at the bottom, and it has you know, the templated uh, op comparison operators, which swallow the right-hand side. And then we do the actual comparison inside of that those comparison overloads, and we construct a result object using um, the result of the actual comparison and the result of stringify, which stringifies the left and right operands of the expression. So here is the result, just a boolean and uh, a string containing the decomposition of the expression. And also stringify just calls to string for left, the left and the right operands. And um, by default, doctest stringifies types using a question mark, but you can teach it how to do it with overloads or by providing a left shift uh, all stream streamable operator for your types. So, let's see how you can teach the framework how to translate um, exceptions. In this case, we have a function which throws, and we're using it inside of an assertion. 
and uh, doc test will print the following if we have taught how to translate my type exceptions. So when we catch the exception and we call the exception the current method, we'll do quite a bunch of things. First of all, there is the iTranslator interface, which is uh, with a single virtual call, virtual function, which returns boolean on success and uh, the result through a string reference. We can use an optional to make it more better, but uh, I can't use C++ headers inside of the interface, and this is part of the interface of the library. So, then I have a translator templated class, which inherits from the iTranslator interface, and uh, in its constructor, I accept a function pointer to the translator function, which will be doing the actual translation of the exceptions of type T. And then I override the translate function by doing the following. I first retrow the current active exception inside of a try block, and I try to catch it as type T, which is the type I'm being instantiated for as a class. And if I succeed, that means I can use my um, function pointer to the translator to translate the function, and I return true. Otherwise, I return false. So when the user somewhere in his code writes a uh, rec translator for some type, it looks like almost like a normal function. It actually expands to the following after the preprocessor. Again, like test cases, we have a forward declaration of the translating function. Then we have a global dummy integer to which we assign the result of rec translator, to which we pass the function pointer to the um, translating function, and then follows the definition of the actual translator itself. And the rec translator function is shown at the bottom. It is also templated, so we can capture for what type uh, we're going to be translating exceptions for. And inside of it, we make a static local object of type translator, which was shown on the last slide. So we instantiate that class for type T, and we give it the function pointer to the translator function the user has just defined. And uh, since it's a local static, its lifetime will be until the program ends, so we can safely pass a pointer to this object to our uh, to the test runner, and that's why we call rec in test runner, and we pass a pointer to it, and uh, that's because it's inheriting from the common iTranslator interface. So when the exception the current method is called to the result builder object, it uses the following translate function. It first iterates with a for loop through all the registered translators and calls translate on them until one of them succeeds. If none of them succeeds, we continue with the default translation, which is, again, we throw the current active exception, and we try to catch it as a std exception reference, std string reference, by a c-string, or if nothing of, nothing of this happens, uh, we return the unknown exception string. So let's talk about compile times, which is like one of the biggest issues for C++. Here is the graph of how much it costs to just include the framework header for catch and doc test. For doc test, it's always around 20 milliseconds. I'm talking about the public part of the header. And for catch, it's between 400 and 500 milliseconds. And uh, I'll talk about how I achieved these results now. Doc test is uh, around 1,200 lines of code after the Visual Studio preprocessor, and catch is more than a megabyte of source code. And that's because doc test doesn't include absolutely any header in its public interface, not even std string or whatever. And um, here the idea is not to bash catch because it is really an amazing project and I've been piggybacking on a lot of the implementation. I've seen how they've done it, for example, uh, crash handling. And uh, they recently started improving their compile times as well as run times, so I think both frameworks are taking ideas from each other. And uh, there are other frameworks which I could have tested. For example, Boost Test has a single header form, but it is way, way, way slower than Catch to compile, so I'm not using it. I still need some, stud, uh, some types from the std namespace inside of the public interface of the framework. And for example, I need std ostream just to support uh, the detection if types are ostream, left shift, uh, streamable. But uh, if I just include the iOS for declaration header, for Visual Studio, I get almost 9,000 lines of code after the preprocessor because actually it drags not just some forward declarations, but also Studio and many, many other stuff. And I don't want to pay that cost. So I'm forward declaring them myself. And I know this is uh, 
undefined behavior and against the standard, but it practically works everywhere. And uh, even if the user wants to be pedantic, there is an option which forces doc test to use the header instead of doing these forward declarations. But currently, uh, all the build metrics and all the tests run smoothly without any problems. And there are also other frameworks which do the same. For example, Boost DI, which is about dependency injection. It also forward declares a bunch of stuff from the std namespace, and uh, it's working. That's, uh, that's important, at least to me. So <coughs> let's see the compile times of the test runner, because we need to instantiate the test runner at least somewhere, in at least some source file of our project. And um, doc test is always faster than catch, but I don't consider this benchmark important because you have to pay this price only once in only one source file. The common case is much more important, which is the public interface of the framework. So yeah, this is not important. But what is curious is that uh, compile times vary wildly depending on compilers and uh, configuration. So let's go about uh, the compile times of the asserts. Doc test has, a, as I talked before, normal expression, expression decomposing asserts, but for power users, there are alternative forms. For example, there are the binary ones, which skip some template machinery, and you supply explicitly the left and right operands and say if it's for equality or inequality. There are also fast binary ones, which are like the binary ones, but they also don't evaluate the expression inside of a try block. And they can be made even faster with a config option, and uh, I'll show what that means later. Catch has the expression decomposing asserts, and it also has such option to make them a bit faster to compile. So the following graphs I'm about to show are for 500 test cases with 100 asserts in each of them. So that amounts to a total of 50,000 asserts. And here are the graphs. And uh, what we can see is that the tallest blue lines are always shorter than the red ones for catch. So doc test is always faster for catch when we're using the expression decomposing asserts. But what we also can see are the other green and uh, brown bars, which are the fastest ones for doc test. So we can have crazy fast compile times for 50,000 asserts just by writing uh, the binary fast one assertions. So in doc test 1.1, I had focused only on the header being very light, but I hadn't focused on the, the assertions to compile very fast. So this is what each assert uh, resulted in after the preprocessor. It was quite a bit of code. It's not important what the code is, it's just that it's quite a lot. And in doc test 1.1, all that code was compacted to the absolute, absolute possible minimum, which is the following. Just a do-while loop, a result builder object, a try-catch block, and an if statement for breaking into the debugger. Here is what the fast binary ones look like, the second snippet. They're just a do-while loop with a function call and an if statement for breaking into the debugger. And when we, conf uh, when we define the super fast asserts identifier, those fast binary ones are turned into a single function call without a do-while loop and without an if statement. And the only difference is that when we break into the debugger, it won't be at the exact point in our code where we have written the assertion, but one level deeper in the call stack inside of the fast binary assert function of doc test. So all we have to do is pop one level up in the call stack and see where the assert was written. And, uh, it's my opinion that uh, it's a very small price to pay for the huge compile time benefits you get. So 50,000 asserts spread across 500 test cases can compile between 20 and 220 seconds, depending on the compiler, which is roughly around 13 to 75% faster than catch. And also the fastest possible versions of the macros are for between 3 and 16 seconds, that for 50,000 asserts. And to achieve these results, I had to annotate a bunch of constructors, destructors, and um, functions to be not inlined. Because if you have some constructor inlined 50,000 times, you could actually end up with slower code and much slower compile times because of all the code generation and uh, all the work the optimizer has to do. And some optimizers for some compilers have really big problems when there are like 20 or 50 or 100 consecutive if statements inside of a function. They just exponentially become slower and slower and you could end up with something like uh, 20 minutes for compiling a single source file. So these benchmarks were done around two months ago, and since then there hasn't been much development in both frameworks, so currently they should be pretty similar. 
Let's talk about the runtime performance. Here I'm looping a simple assertion 10 million times and I'm comparing two integers. And uh, of course, this is a micro benchmark and it's uh, in the hot path and uh, it's in the cache and etc. but it's not optimized away. And what we immediately can see is that uh, exactly for Visual Studio in the book, it's way, way, way slower for catch. And that can be explained perhaps by differences in the implementation of the STL. But uh, for all other configurations, also released in Visual Studio, it's fine. And doc test is a bit faster, but uh, I think both frameworks have achieved pretty fast uh, runtime. But uh, it, this wasn't always the case. Like one year ago, both frameworks were significantly slower, slower. And some users started reporting that their unit tests took uh, minutes to run, which is not the idea for unit tests. So for doc test 1.2, I did the following things. I sped up the runtime around 30 times for the common case, which is when nothing fails. Because if you have thousands of asserts, only a few of them might fail, but uh, the common case is where everything passes. So the two biggest gains, uh, the two biggest features for compile time, uh, I mean for runtime, which I got were from not constructing strings if asserts don't fail, and from also employing the small string optimization for my string class. Uh, you can check out the strange details of the string at Facebook talk from Nicholas from last year's CPPCon. It's an amazing talk, and uh, you'll know what the short buffer optimization is after it. And um, the other two things I tried to do were the following. I made some, I implemented move semantics for my classes, but um, for the common case where there are no allocations, so there are no deep copies, I mean, when there are no allocations, even if you move an object, it's still a shallow copy, so it's practically the same. And, uh, but this will pay up, I mean, pay, this will benefit for the case when something fails, the move semantics. And also, I made sure that no local statics were accessed during the runtime. That gave me around 1% gain, which is uh, not very important. So, if you have been convinced that mixing tests and production code is feasible, uh, what you could do is just mix them, and when you're building the final build, you could just define the disable identifier and strip out the tests and ship the pro product to the customer. Or you could leave in the tests in the binary and uh, disable them from running by default. Why would you want to do that? For example, if the user has ex is experiencing some bug which you can't reproduce locally, your, your first, first line of defense might be to ask them to run their tests on their machine, because only there it's being reproduced. If uh, your customers are not end users, but are other developers, so if you're making header-only libraries, you could put the tests for your framework at the end of the header, surrounded by some if dev, so your users could optionally compile them. So, uh, it's also a good idea to always prefix your test cases if you're like making a library for other developers, so it could be easily filtered out. Or maybe use a test suite. When you're making not header-only libraries, but compiled ones, for example, shared objects, uh, in order for the shared object to link, you have to implement the test runner inside of it. But uh, that becomes a problem when there are multiple shared objects, each with its uh, own test runner implementation, so you can't easily aggregate the results of the tests. In that case, you can use the config implementation in DLL identifier, which tells uh, one binary to export the in test runner, and all the other binaries will link to it. So when the program starts, all the test cases will be registered in one single place, no matter how many shared objects and executables you have, and this will work even for plugins which are loaded on the go later. So that's very nice. <laughs> also, if you're making uh, static libraries, uh, then it's pretty much the same, but there are some issues with self-registering code, which is common to all frameworks which uh, do the same trick uh, for registering code before entering main. But uh, there are some ways to, ways to mitigate that, which uh, you can read more about on the frequently asked questions of the documentation of the project. So here is how I use the framework. I have a proxy header which I include, so I make the fast binary asserts even faster, and I also define my own convenience macros in the forms I would like to use them. And then I use this header to have the fastest possible compile times and nice syntax. 
Most of the effort went in familiarizing myself with the testing in general and the other frameworks. Also not dragging any headers in the public part of the header. Uh, the more than 300 different builds on the CI were, they literally took more than a few weeks of non-stop only that. Uh, there were some funny warnings with, which took a lot of effort to track down. For example, the strict overflow one on level 5 only with some versions of GCC when something gets inlined somewhere and you get a report for a warning from your code but you don't get the actual line number. And you don't, so you don't know what actually got inlined and what is causing the warning. So you have to track down what your last changes were and etc. I also filed my first unique compiler bug, which was related to sanitizer integration, and it's already been fixed. And I hit many, many other toolchain problems. The road ahead, I have to implement reporters to XML, to user-defined. Uh, it would be nice to execute tests in parallel, or no, not in parallel, but in separate processes for isolation, at least under Unix. Also, more common line options, ID integration with Visual Studio, Xcode, and etc. And uh, the ability to call assertions from multiple threads. So I'm not talking about spawning multiple test cases in multiple threads, but the ability for the user to spawn multiple threads within a single test case and to have assertions in them. Because currently, uh, aggregating assertions is uh, not straightforward for users. Uh, the idea of doc test came to me around three years ago and development accelerated when I quit my job and the first version was uh, released a few months later. And uh, it's around, it, it takes me around five to six months to make another release. I think I came a little bit late to the party. I mean, nobody is uh, making new testing frameworks nowadays. Everybody is using Google Test or Catch or Boost Test. But I really think that such results wouldn't have been possible without starting from scratch. And also, a modest goal for doc test is to make it the de facto standard for unit testing in C++. It should be so light and transparent, it should be as a language feature. So you really don't notice it. And uh, thank you very much. These are the slides and some links to my w website, to the project. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and you'll get the microphone. Yeah, hi. So my question is, when you, right here, you're forward declaring things in the STD namespace, and a few slides before you said you're using all the sanitizers. So I'm wondering if the UBSAN is not... Uh, Nothing. Not angry at you? N not <laughs> angry. Okay. And I've also enabled a bunch of flags which are off by default for the sanitizers, which are to make the program too slow or something like that. So I've enabled practically everything I could. Uh, did you try to use Clang format with this? Because <coughs> I, you have some crazy macros there, so yeah. I'm wondering if, uh, if this messes something up because I've seen crazy stuff going on with such macros. Well, no, I mean, I'm pretty happy with Clang format. I mean, it just works. Yeah, it just works even for this header and all these macros and additional compilation and stuff. You should use it, really. Okay. Okay, uh, I was al always wondering, how do you test uh, your test frameworks? I mean, do you write tests for your uh, doc test? Well, currently there's one issue which is opened that I should doc feed doc test to itself. and. Uh, I should unit test more of the internals, but what I'm currently doing is that all of the examples and tests I have, I save the output they have uh, produced in text files, and then on the CI, I compare the current output with the reference output. So, and I've tested all the features I support, so to me, I've called, I don't know, I think so far it's been enough. I think it should be more. I should unit test the internals, but I haven't gotten to that yet. Any other questions? Here's one up in the front. Okay. Mm, from what I saw on your slides, there is no option to um, check for the exception, when the exception thrown out of your function is exactly what you expect. 
Uh, there is such an assertion. I mean, yes, I, I can haven't seen it. Yeah, I just mentioned to check if so if something throws or doesn't throw, but you can also check for what throws. And what's coming in the future <laughs> version will be to check uh, if when something throws and what if if some string is contained inside of the what. I mean, <coughs> how do I explain this? Damn, brain freeze. Sorry. So yeah, in the future it will be possible to check if the exception that is thrown, the message it carries, if uh, it contains some string. So you could check for... Only the message or the type of the exception? Currently you can check for the type, but in the future we'll be able to check for the message as well. Where was that? Where was that? Here it is. <laughs> yeah. Any other question? Uh, here is one question in the front. Yes. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, you mentioned about this uh, spawning threads inside the test case so the user launches his own uh, threads and uh, related to, and the issue related to synchronization of asserts. Uh, can you maybe elaborate here how it works behind the scenes? Uh, it's currently not implemented. I mean, this oh, is okay. planned in the future because it's widely requested. Okay, thank you. Um. If you could um, convince somebody that uh, need to switch from a catch to yours, um, what your wo words would be? Well, you have to include a different header. You have to use the approx helper out of the docs test namespace because it's used by default in catch. You have to substitute all sub, uh, section macros with subcase, or you could also just define it globally. and. Uh, Catch supports um, test cases with not just names, but also tags, which is uh, an optional second string literal to the test case macro. I've decided not to support that in order to support uh, decorators, which were like this. So you could uh, redefine the test case macro to just concatenate the two string literals it receives if you're using that form of the test case macro for catch. So this should be all the major differences, the major yeah. ones. Yeah, yeah. So it, um, the, the speed is uh, amazing. Uh, it's uh, ten times or maybe more, sometimes uh, better. But uh, I'm thinking about uh, what uh, what user will will lose if switch from catch to yours. It's some something. Well, yeah. Currently, doc test supports only console output. It. Uh, I have to implement a reporter system, so it's XML formatted, you know, X unit, J unit, all that stuff. A uh, different thing, another thing is matchers and uh, for being able to check what string is contained inside of the exception that got thrown is actually one of the things which Catch has and Doctest doesn't. And uh, I think these are the two major ones which will be mi missing if you switch from Catch to Doctest. Any other questions? There's one in the middle. Hello, do you support any kind of mocking mechanism? No, I think mocking and testing should be uh, orthogonal. I may be wrong, today I'm going to attend a talk on mocking. And uh, yeah, there are many things with that which I should familiarize myself. But doc test also supports um, some macros which uh, some mocking frameworks are already using to integrate themselves with doc test. So there is a way to integrate sort of easily. Any more well, questions? There's one more in the middle. How about tests which will be written in the header? If you have a template which is entirely written in the header, this test will be included in all the CPP files. You include this header? Well, this test will be registered only once, but of course, um, so if you're making a header only library and your tests are in the header and they're conditionally compiled, the user may include your header everywhere, but only in one source file he could conditionally compile the tests as well, so he wouldn't bloat his compile times. 
but so far he has to manually choose where he wants to put the test. Well, yeah, he could uh, put them everywhere. It is not an error. It's just going to lead to slightly bigger compile times for him. Okay, thank you. So, if there are no more questions, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Viktor Kirillov.